Well, hello everybody. Thank you for tuning in. <clears throat> I'm going to try to keep this brief, but it's difficult without scripting it and reading it. <laughs> uh, I tend to babble, but anyway, um, babbling about babbling. There you go. I read a thing uh, this morning that I posted at uh, Globe Hackers on Facebook, but apparently um, our ancestors about 900,000 years ago um, were pushed to the brink of extinction and they're estimating that there was only uh, 1,280 humans left on the planet. And then it's very interesting. There's lots of lines of evidence and lots of the clues come from modern DNA research. But you might want to go read that. So I just find it fascinating. I mean, we, we almost went away long ago and we could be challenged again in the future. So what, what will come next? And how will our species change uh, when you know, pushed to that kind of stressor, like near extinction. Will it impact our evolution over time? Obviously, but it's interesting. So maybe you want to read that. That's at Facebook at uh, Globe Hackers. So um, <clears throat> before I go on to other things, I'm back to the game theory. And uh, I wanted to read from notes here today and just ground us a little bit in what ideology is and what it means because it's so important. Uh, so many of us now are so blatantly and stubbornly ideological, not that we know where our ideas are coming from or where they, yeah, where the ideas came from or how we absorb them. Uh, we just take it for granted that our ideas um, are our ideas, and therefore great ideas, right? So from the dictionary, uh, the first definition, more modern, and the second one is archaic. But anyway, a system of ideas and ideals, especially one which forms the basis of economic or political theory and policy. So yeah, and these theories and policies, these ideas, these constructs, um, you know, they're fairly shallow, really, and they're very religious in nature, in a sense, that we believe in them based on the stories we tell ourselves, based on the goals that we have, or certain segments of the, the society has. And then they all get formulated and formalized into some kind of dogma. And then they get disseminated down the chain to the plebs and proles, and then we all think that uh, ideologies of a certain group of people represents the truth. And maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, but one should question one's ideology regardless. That should be basic. So the archaic uh, definition is the science of ideas, the study of their origin and nature. And I think we should study the origin and nature of our ideas. We should make that a habit. We should question ourselves and our ideas. So I'll go on a little bit more to fill this out and give an example of a line of thinking about it. Ideology refers to beliefs, values, ideas, and principles that guide individuals, groups, or societies in understanding the world and their approach to various issues. I know we all think we know what ideology is, but bear with me. It serves as a framework for interpreting and evaluating events, shaping opinions, and guiding behavior. Ideologies often encompass multiple topics, including politics, economics, social issues, culture, etc. They are crucial in shaping how people perceive reality and make decisions. So we have these ideological lenses that give us a certain perspective on things. And I keep talking about culture. We can't really move on and have control without uh, engaging our culture and, and what our culture represents. So what we think and what we believe and what we do, this is culture together as a collective, as a society, as a group, uh, on whatever scale. But of course, today's the scale is global, so it's, it's really in, 
insane. So if you're Ian McGilchrist type of perspective on it, it's all very left brain deconstruction, deconstructionist and so on, materialist and whatnot, hyper materialist. But that's another story. But um, this is what makes us think of the world the way it is. So if you're watching TV all day, there's going to be a certain ideological thing that gets implanted in your brain and you're going to become a parrot of it without even knowing it. And you're going to be very emotionally attached to, to these ideas because you listen to them 24-7 and you don't question them. So ideolo ideologies can be both explicit and implicit, meaning they can be openly articulated or underlying assumptions that influence a person's perspective. They are often rooted in historical, cultural, and socioeconomic contexts and can evolve based on changing circumstances and new information. Of course, ideologies evolve. We know that from studying philosophy and uh, looking at history and looking at fashion. We're all, to some degree, slaves to fashion, you know, bell bottoms to skinny jeans and, uh, you know, uh, twerking and big butts, uh, Rubenesque versus Twiggy. But not just shallow fashion, but fashion in terms of ideas, ways to think, Renaissance, Enlightenment, uh, you know, postmodernism, um, whatever. So it's important that we interrogate these things so we understand ourselves better and we can have more fun. We can engage maybe the spiritual and the sacred and the more deeper meanings of the vast, awe-inspiring experience of just being here, which is unfathomably uh, miraculous and lucky. And of course, if you weren't born in uh, Sudan or Yemen or something today, then you're just so much, 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 much more lucky. And if you don't have to go fight in a war and be turned into vapor by a, a shell, exploding shell, uh, you're even more fortunate. So interrogate these ideas that get us in trouble. That's another thing I'm going to go talk about. Oligarchs and dictators, autocrats in the next video, I think. But uh, ideology is often associated with an aversion to compromise. And this is the confidence bias I was talking about. So we don't want to compromise because we have our ideology. So I wonder if the new world government wants to make homogenize everybody and turn them into a certain type of human being, brave new world type of thing. Would that happen if we were all Greek practicing Greek Orthodox Christianity? Would we be homogenized or would there be diversity in that in some way? But once you have to adhere to the dogma and the teachings of this, that, or the other thing. Are you not homogenized, at least ideologically? So these are questions you can ask yourself. So uh, ideology is the mother of all intangible incentives like money, status, glory, righteous outrage, etc. Religious principles and political ideals are their rewards. Uh, kind of the, their own reward, as it, as it were. You know, adhering to your beliefs, your, your ideas, is its own reward. There's a, there's a self-righteous component to it. It's an intangible incentive. You know, it can motivate you to do all kinds of criminal things or great things or evil things, depending on what's going on in the context and all that. So I was just saying, United States, for example, wants to expand its way of life to the world, its concepts and ideologies. That grew out of a very specific set of historical circumstances over time, emerged, if you will, and suddenly we just want to take for granted that the rest of the world has to be controlled by our ideas. That's what empire does colonialism, so on and so forth. We want to go out and evangelize our way of, of life. Unfortunately, most of the world has, there's a, a Chinese saying that says, drink deeper, taste not the Western spring. And the world has 
drank a heck of a lot of the Western Spring. I know that by having visited places, you know, decades ago and watching them change culturally, watching the malls move in and the big box stores and, and watching Bali turn into a museum, kind of a tourist place, you know, like uh, a cultural simulacrum of what it was before when the culture actually was meaningful and, and rooted, deeply rooted. So um, despite being in a slow boiling constitutional crisis over the past five years, American leaders are steeped in the ideological underpinnings of exceptionalism and righteousness and libertarianism and so on. And you can break that down by reading other literature. I'm just saying there's an ideology there. It permeates everything. We Americans swim in it. We're part of this whole thing. And it, 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 whether you're conservative or liberal, whatever you, however you identify politically, we're all in the same bath together, you know, jostled about. We're not as different as we think we are. And powerful forces, powerful people, powerful organizations, corporations, and so on, are very capable of using these small differences like culture war issues against us to manipulate us. It's just, you know, it's not Edward Bernays per, ne, per se, or people that came before him, you know, uh, people who describe propaganda, uh, McLuhan and whatnot. You know, it's just there all the time and we're buffeted about and influenced by it. So even though the game has always been played in America, Americans are at each other's throat. So uh, they're pissed off at each other because of these culture war issues. And one thing is sure, Americans hate each other more than any other person could hate, any other country could hate Americans. Most people don't really hate Americans from Jordan or Israel or Japan or wherever, Bhutan. Uh, we, we, you know, it's like a family feud. You, you can really hate someone in your family more than you could hate anybody else, you know. So, uh, and also the Americans just hate foreigners because they don't understand them. They, they, they're ignorant of, of, of their culture. They don't get them. So it's also a very easy scapegoat to use by powerful interests to keep people on their ideological, in their ideological swamps. Uh, so, Foreigners, yeah, some people are more equal, more exceptional uh, than others, right? This is typical. So again, I'm not going to go too much more into this because you could talk about all kinds of examples. You can tell all kinds of stories uh, from history and whatnot. But, uh, you know, like I said, when I was riding my bicycle, um, what do you give a man or a person who has everything? You give them more control. And a great way to control people is to formalize ideological systems and disseminate them through institutions uh, and have people buy into them. Then you have them, you own them. They won't even know where the ideology came from. They're not like in high school or university saying, oh, I'm being kind of programmed by an ideology. It's an operating system, if you will, these ideas, these beliefs. And it, by and large, determines our culture. So let's just take a few minutes every day and kind of question where we get our ideas from. Interrogate these ideas, interrogate our beliefs, what we take for granted, and reach out and look for other ideas to, to compare and contrast with and to interrogate. And then maybe at some point we'll feel a greater connection to everything. But this is analytical and it's not for everybody. And I don't think it's the future of human culture at some point after we, after this way of life, more or less destroys our habitat, we're going to have to regroup and reevaluate our values 
And I think they're going to be very different in the future than they are now. But even now, we can choose to see things in different ways. So break away from your ideology a bit, experiment with different ways of being and seeing and feeling the world so that you can connect better with life and with people and with nature and so on and so forth. And you'll feel kind of a weight lifting off of you when you're not burdened and driven down by the dogma of your ideology. And you can kind of free yourself from it a little bit. Doesn't mean we shouldn't have ideologies, uh, beliefs, ideas, thoughts, and so on, but we should connect them to our feelings and a deeper understanding of better wisdom uh, than just the reflexive kind of uh, puppeted uh, behavior that we're trained in. Okay, so thank you for listening. Take good care. Have a wonderful day. Bulianti, out.